Hi, everybody. Thanks for, for joining. We'll go ahead and kick off in about two minutes. All right, it is 12 o'clock, so we will go ahead and kick off. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for joining this webinar. We're going to do a, a brief introduction and then go ahead and, and jump right into it. So a little bit of background. Tyler decided to, to do these webinars because of the shelter in place currently in effect. And with everyone at home, he thought it'd be a great time to share information about the assistive technology products that have shared his life or changed his life. We're, we're extremely lucky to have groups uh, like Microsoft willing to pass along this information and provide a direct line to Microsoft in a form where, where you know, that's not normally available. So we will be doing a Q&A session at the end. So please feel free to ask any questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. Um, to kick off, we're, we're going to go ahead and introduce the panelists. So we have Tyler Shrink. Uh, president or Tyler Shrink, president of the, the Tyler Shrink Foundation, Caitlin Jones, uh, an occupational therapist from Warfighter Engaged, and Brandon Zahan, uh, a game accessibility uh, program manager with Microsoft. So, um, with that said, thanks again, everyone, for joining, and we'll, we'll hand it over to Tyler to kick off. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, as Colin mentioned, Never thought I'd be doing a webinar, but honestly, any chance I can get to wear my fancy dress shoes, I will. So that's the main purpose of this, is me getting to wear my dress shoes. But anyways, um, really lucky to have Brandon here and Caitlin. Brandon's been incredibly patient with me because I spelt his name wrong on everything I sent out. It's not Brandon, it's Brandon with two N's. And so, yeah, that didn't look too good <laughs> on my part. So, my bad, man. Uh, no, it's so not good. Yeah, how we're going to start this is I'm going to let uh, Brandon and Caitlin talk a little about what the Xbox controller is and what the purpose of it is, and then we'll get into kind of some setup and demonstrations. So go ahead, guys. Great. Thanks so much, Tyler. Yeah, hi, I am Brandon Zahand. Uh, I am a gaming accessibility program manager at Microsoft. I've been working at Microsoft 22 years. I've been working with the disability community about 24 years. And today uh, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about the Xbox Adaptive Controller, which I've got right here. Uh, the Xbox Adaptive Controller really is uh, the culmination of a, a vision that was started by a, a one individual at Microsoft, a guy by the name of Matt Height, he had this great um, idea that we could find ways to make our technology, um, our gaming technology more useful for people with disabilities by creating an interface that could allow assistive tech to essentially plug in to our console. And uh, after many, many years uh, of working on that, this is the product we've, we've come up with. So, Essentially, what the device does, and I'm going to let Caitlin talk a little bit more about this in a second, is it does allow assistive tech of all different types, um, um, sip and puff controllers, uh, bite switches, large uh, big buttons, um, micro light switches, motion switches, you name it. It allows it to connect to the Xbox in a way that it in the past never really could. Um, and to before we we go a little more into the device, I just want to take a moment and uh, talk to you a little bit about kind of how we got here and where we're going with this device. So I'm sharing out my screen right now. And so uh, 
we at Microsoft believe that right now uh, our, we have a very large audience of gamers who need this technology. You know, we feel there's about 7.6 billion people in the world, and of that, um, estimates are about 4 billion of those are connected users. And connected users mean that they have some type of access to an electronic device on which they can game. It could be a phone, it could be a console, it could be a computer, it could be a tablet, whatever. Now, of that, uh, we believe 2 billion of those 4 billion people are actual gamers. They're actually people who play games. Now, that doesn't mean they're hardcore, you know, the stereotypical 15-year-old uh, kid sitting in, in the basement, you know, playing Call of Duty. These could be people like my dad, who's 75 years old and plays Pokemon Go. Uh, these could be people like my five-year-old, who love to play uh, Dragon City on his iPad, right? Um, but these are people who enjoy playing electronic games on their devices. And we then extrapolate from that, based off of World Health Organization uh, statistics, that there are over 200 million of those gamers that have some sort of disability that could impact their gameplay experience. So what does that mean? Why is that important? Well, we wanna make sure that for those gamers and for the, all gamers, we are building the most inclusive gaming platform on the planet. We want to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. That's Microsoft's mission statement. But that isn't just productivity. That isn't just, you know, um, you know, Office and uh, Windows, that's also gaming. Because what we know is that when we all play, everybody wins. This is something I've seen time and time again uh, working at Seattle Children's Hospital and Regional Medical Center. Um, gaming has become social. It is a way for us to connect. You know, I mentioned my father earlier. He uses gaming as an opportunity to connect with his grandchildren right? I use Minecraft to connect to friends overseas and play games with them, right? And so we want to ensure that everyone can play. We don't want anyone to be excluded because we know what it feels like. I think all of us at some point or another in our life has felt what it means to be excluded, to, to feel left out. No one likes that feeling and we want to uh, try our best to make sure no one has to go through that. Now, the Xbox Adaptive Controller that we're going to be talking about today isn't where we started. We've actually been working on accessibility features for the console for a really long time. We started with controller button remapping back in 2016. Then we introduced Copilot, which allows two controllers to act as a single controller, which is super, super helpful for folks who are caregivers, um, parents of younger uh, uh, children, um, uh, people who are perhaps therapists, and Caitlin will talk a little bit more about OT and how the adaptive controller can work in occupational therapy situations. But again, it lets two controllers essentially act as if they're a single controller. Then we came out with the adaptive controller in 2018. And now what I work on primarily is finding ways to make games more accessible, uh, to make the actual software more accessible for folks themselves. But again, the device we're here to talk about today is the Xbox adaptive controller, this gadget here. And with that, I'm gonna hand uh, things over to Caitlin to have her tell you a little bit about how the device works. Cool, hi everyone. Um, as Brandon mentioned, I'm an occupational therapist and I also work with Warfighter Engaged, and we're a nonprofit that makes adapted video equipment for uh, mostly veterans who have sustained traumatic injuries. Um, and we were also fortunate enough to partner with Microsoft during the original phases of creating the Xbox Adaptive Controller, and they were really receptive to our feedback and working together, so it was a super awesome experience. Um, and yeah, when it comes to the Adaptive Controller, as Brandon mentioned, there's a lot of versatility in ways that you can really adapt this product to meet the needs of the individual that is using it. And that comes in one of two ways. One of the ways is through software remapping, which Brandon is going to talk a little bit more about later. Um, but the other beautiful part of the adaptive controller is the simplicity with its hardware. So if you're not a super tech savvy person or you're not ready to kind of delve into the software remapping side of things, 
if you take a look at the back of the Xbox adaptive controller shown here, there is a designated port for every single button that you would find on a standard Xbox controller. Um, there's also two more wildcard ports that you can assign to something else through the software remapping. So let's say you have an individual who, um, you know, they want to play a golf game, like I think we're going to the future later, and they need the A button to swing their golf club, but they cannot access the A button, they can't press it on a standard controller for, you know, a variety of different reasons. So you could essentially take any kind of switch button that has a 3.5 millimeter plug, which is the same as a stereo um, headset jack, and you would just plug it into the A button and then you would take that switch button and mount it to wherever the person can access it. And there you go, there you have your A button. Let's say um, you need something else, you need a B or a right trigger. It's just as simple as plug and play. You plug in the button where you need it, you put it in space where the person can access it. And um, it's really that simple to kind of move forward from there. And we've seen it used in a lot of ways in the therapy community is, um, if you're working on range of motion, you want somebody to reach a little bit higher, get that, you know, higher range of motion angle on their shoulder, you could take the button and you could hold it a little bit higher. You're engaging your patient or your client in something that they love. They're having fun playing the game. They're not even realizing that they're reaching higher or they're doing more repetitive presses and getting all those exercises and movements that you're trying to work on with them because they're having so much fun while they're gaming. A lot of times what I would do is when my client wasn't paying attention is I would slowly start moving the button just a little bit further and a little bit further and they wouldn't even realize that they're working that much harder because they're having so much fun. So definitely from an accessibility standpoint, of just people wanting to game and become better gamers. This is awesome, but it's also been really cool to see it evolve in the therapy space and make both people better people, better people and better gamers. Absolutely. Uh, Caitlin, did you want to really, really quickly talk a little bit about the types of devices that can be plugged in? Sure. Um, so we talked a little bit about the 3.5 millimeter uh, jacks in the back. So any kind of switches can be plugged into there. But there's also two USB ports that are on the right and left side of the Xbox adaptive controller. And this is where you're going to be able to plug in um, things like joysticks, like the little um, PDP controller that's on the left there. There's also a variety of sip and puff um, types of controllers that can be plugged in as well. Some are the quad stick, the lip sync, um, and a variety of other different ones. So there's a lot of versatility that could be used here. Um, and we can delve into it a little bit more when Brandon starts to look at the software remapping. Yeah, and one other thing to call out too is the reason we designed the device to use USB and 3.5 millimeter jacks is because we wanted people to be able to use the technology they were already using. So as an example, a lot of people we noticed were already using big buttons for other types of uh, adaptive uh, uses in their homes with their computers, etc. We didn't want people to have to go out and repurpose and buy a bunch of custom uh, new equipment to use with the adaptive controller. With this, they can just plug these directly into uh, the devices uh, or into the adaptive controller and they're using the devices they already um, they, they already own. Right and for those of us that are familiar working with people who use switch buttons to na navigate their wheelchairs or iPads and things like that it's again like Brandon mentioned the same standard jack is you could literally unplug it from the iPad or the hook that's connecting it into the iPad and use it with the adaptive controller so if you're already using them you'll likely already have what you need to kind of get started. So that's it. Great, thanks guys. So I think for button mapping, we'll go ahead and um, do you want to share your screen, Brandon, or should I show my Xbox screen? Do you have a yeah, preference? I, I can, I'm happy to share mine. Yeah, sounds great. And then also, Caitlin, can you hold up the Xbox Adaptive Controller and quickly just show the ports on the back? Here's the HDMI, here's this, here's that. Again, Actually, we'll you know, if, it might be easier. Were you guys, uh, I'm, and I apologize, were you guys uh, showing out my screen as I was as I was talking? Were you sharing out my slides? No, my bad. Ah, no, hey, no, I, no worries. We're all learning in this yeah, new uh, work from home, remote situation. Yeah. Yeah, this has all yeah. been new to us. I tell you what, why don't, um, if you, uh, if you uh, share out my screen right now, there's a better image I think that will help uh, desc uh, describe things cool. better, be easier for people to see. Great. So, Caleb, so, you want to do this real quickly one more time here? Just sure. so yeah. 
So Brandon, I think we need you to actually share your screen. Um, oh. And you're, you're right now presenting your uh, webcam and not the screen. So you need to share the screen and mute your webcam. Okay. Mm. How do I share my screen? Um, Is it that on the drop down? No. To my webcam. I apologize. Can you let me know where we go to share our screen? Yeah, give me one second here. I think I might need to make you a presenter. Give me one second. Yeah, that's on me, Brandon. I put you in the wrong login. Sorry, um, everyone. So if you go to sharing, you should have uh, the very top item in the drop down list to the right for the webinar. There's a sharing menu. And okay. you should be able to select your screen from there under show. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's gonna work. It's uh, still showing me as an attendee. It's not showing me as a. Um... I'm making you a presenter now. So oh, let's here see we go. That... Here we go. That's doing it. Sorry, oh, Brandon. Go ahead. Sorry about that. This is not Microsoft technology, so I'm not as familiar with it. Uh, so yeah. So let me uh, show. Uh, uh, let me uh, move this out of the way, and uh, I'll have Caitlin uh, talk through it one more time here. Cool. Um, and we're good with the screen share. It's up now. I think so, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, so here's the image we were referencing earlier. As you can see on the back here, all of the 3.5 millimeter ports, which again, those are those headphone stereo jack type um, inputs, and they're all pretty clearly labeled. So you have starting from the left to the right, Y, X, B, A. Um, you have all even things like stick presses, uh, the D-pad, uh, power button, everything like that. So. Um, this is where you're going to be able to do that really easy plug and play. I need an A button. I'm going to take my switch, plug it into the A port, and now I have my A button that I could put anywhere that I want um, in space for the person that needs to access it. And then you'll see on the right side over there, uh, yep, that's where the uh, USB ports that we were talking about where you could plug in kind of more intricate things like joysticks and uh, different types of zip and puff and mouth controllers. And just a just a quick example of some of those uh, can be seen right here. Just a myriad of the different technologies. Uh, we have a Logitech uh, Flightmaster uh, joystick here. Uh, you put that on the ground, somebody can be using that with their feet. You can put it um, for somebody who doesn't have fine motor control, but maybe gross motor control that can be set on a table and they can move their arm to press it back and forth, up and down. We have a sip and puff controller here on the right. Uh, we have some micro light switches on the top. This is actually a sewing machine pedal. Uh, right here. So uh, that's, you get it, it's, you know, from uh, Amazon. I think it's like 20 bucks. It's just a sewing machine pedal that can plug in. We've got obviously our big button switches, but we also have small switches. We even, um, I've seen uh, bite switches used. I've seen uh, motion sensing switches used. Uh, what you've got here is a mounting bracket that will plug into the back of the device. So it can very easily be mounted to a table or mounted to a wheelchair. Uh, and uh, this again was the PDP controller that uh, Caitlin was talking about earlier. Very lightweight, one-handed controller, really easy uh, uh, to use. Um, very reminiscent of um, older style controllers, uh, some older style controllers. Uh, so really, uh, really cool stuff there. And so yeah, with that being said, let's go to my um, uh, Xbox and show you a little bit about the software remapping. So. <clears throat> so when you uh, plug in the con uh, the controller, <clears throat> excuse me, frog in my throat, first time, you're going to uh, be uh, uh, taken to a menu and you'll be uh, shown a little bit about the controller. And then you will be uh, brought to a screen that looks something like this. Um, here you can see I've got my standard controller uh, that I'm using right now to navigate. And then on the left side here, I've got the Xbox adaptive controller. And you can see that there's a bunch of green lines coming out of it with letters and symbols. That's basically how I've remapped certain buttons to become uh, diff uh, different actions or different uh, uh, functionality. So as an example, if we go into uh, here and go to the configure screen, you'll see that I've got uh, three different games uh, up here at the top. Those are currently loaded on the device. The device has a button on the bottom of it, uh, right above the directional pad, that um, you can press and a different light will come on. That light will indicate if you're on profile one, two, 
three, or if you're not set to a, um, a profile or essentially you're in the default mode where everything's working uh, out of the box. Uh, in this case, I've loaded three different profiles. On profile one, I've loaded Forza. On number two, I've loaded Power Star Golf. And number three, I've loaded Halo. And sorry, Brandon. To be clear, these profiles that Brandon created, just because they're called Forza or Halo, um, he created them and he named them that, so those don't come pre-created. Exactly. In fact, let's show you what it looks like to create a new profile. So let's say I'm creating a new profile for a friend, a family member, uh, an OT client. What I would do is I would go up to new profile and I would type in the name that I want to uh, give it. And so in this case, I'm going to, uh, let's say we were doing one for, um, oh, I don't know, Sea of Thieves, right? And what'll happen is the screen will come up and you'll see that all those little back ports on the, on the back of the device actually have lines going up to different, uh, the different commands that they currently represent. If I wanna change one of them, so for example, let's say I need the left trigger to be the uh, B button. I can click on that button and I can set the primary action to the B button. And now you'll notice if I back out of here that the B button is now associated to that port. However, I might want to assign a secondary function. We have the capability of doing something called shift on the device. And what shift essentially allows you to do is it allows you to have all the buttons on the device change if you're holding down another button, very similar to a shift key on a keyboard. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make this B button my shift button. I'm gonna click that, use as shift. And you'll see that now on the device, there's a big up arrow that's indicating that that's being used as shift. Now what I can do is I can set the shift function for that B button to be something else. So I'll sh uh, set it to be the um, left, uh, and let's do the uh, left stick click. So now when I press that button that is plugged into what used to be the uh, left trigger port, I will get a B. Unless I'm holding down the shift button, which is currently the large uh, pad on the right of the controller, then it will become the left stick click button. So that's just some of the remapping you can do. There's other functionality you can do in terms of swapping um, a joystick axes. So for example, if I have a joystick plugged into the USB port on the left of the device and the right of the device, I could say that I want to swap uh, the sticks of those devices. So to do that, uh, I'm gonna go into, uh, here we go. And I'm going to say swap X axis with right stick swap y-axis with right stick if I want to. Um, I could also invert the y-axis. This is really useful. A lot of gamers prefer um, down to make them look up and up to make them look down. You can invert that right there. You can make those setting changes as well. There's some other functionality you can use um, by using the right bumpers on the controller. You press right bumper and it will allow you to adjust, adjust the sensitivity uh, curve of the uh, stick. So basically how far you have to push it before uh, the the device is activated and how fast the uh, the movement uh, accelerates. Uh, and you can also, um, if you really want to get nerdy, there's a calculation uh, uh, component here that'll let you determine how that sensitivity is actually calculated. That's that's really only I think for for us nerds. Uh, so at any rate, a lot of ability to to, to customize. So. I've created the Sea of Thieves profile now. Now I want to assign it to one of those slots on the device. I'll just go in and I will go up here to the right and say, I want to assign it to slot one. And now you can see it's slot one on the device. And if I press the button on the device and the first light lights up, that means I'm now on the Sea of Thieves profile. Um, one other thing to call out, um, three profiles can be loaded on the device at any given time, but an Xbox Live account can have up to 255 profiles stored in memory. So you'll notice that I have a Forza, a Minecraft, an Overcooked profile here. Those are stored with my Xbox Live profile. So if I go to my friend's house and I sign in, and I bring my adaptive controller along, all of those profiles will come down so I can very easily assign them. This works great in hospitals. You can create a set of uh, profiles uh, for all the different games you have that are kind of like you can have a one hand profile, you could have um, 
uh, you know, a, a easy profile, which only makes available the, the essential components needed to play the game. And then you can store them all against the uh, profiles on your consoles so that you can easily get to them when you need to. One other thing to call out, if you're ever confused and you're like, I don't know why a button is behaving the way it is or if it's not behaving the way it's supposed to, there's this cool little function down here. It looks like a little beaker glass. If you click on that, what it'll do is it'll tell you what any one of the buttons uh, pressed or clicked on the adaptive controller uh, actually is reporting back to the devices. So you'll notice um, if I press the uh, A button here, it'll say that the A button is being pressed. So um, really handy if you need to uh, just check and figure out why your profile isn't quite working the way you expect it to. And I think that's it for now on the uh, software remapping. Are we ready? Great. All right. So we were following along as Brandon was talking, and we set up an Xbox adaptive controller. So now we're going to watch me play some golf. I can't think of many things any better than watching someone else play golf, because most people <laughs> don't even want to watch people play golf. So bear with me. Oh, I'm also going to show you guys how to use, uh, it's called Xbox Assistant. Is that right, Brandon, the voice control? Yes, the Xbox, uh, to use the uh, Xbox uh, uh, skills that are built into, uh, or that are built into the Xbox and now available on Alexa. Great, okay, here we go. Alexa, tell Xbox to open PowerStar Golf. Sounds good. Starting PowerStar Golf. And I have an A button app, so I'll just tap A. Maybe. Hold on. Technical issues. So far, we've done pretty good. So, one moment. Oh, can you pair the controller again? Yep. So, I guess this is a good troubleshooting thing. I think we may have lost pairing on the controller. So, we'll pair it again real quick. Yeah, and Tyler, this is a fantastic time to call out really quick that, especially for folks who are using this in an occupational therapy setting community, or for people who are using this um, uh, regularly at home, um, while the device supports wireless, it's really helpful to always have the device connected whenever possible using the USB cable, because that means that if for some reason um, the Wi-Fi gods get angry at us, or if um, you want to turn on, um, or if the battery dies in the device, you can still use the, the device using the wired uh, USB port. Great. All right, here we go. We're going to do some playing. Great. One moment. Yeah, so we're not an issue again. Let's press and hold. Yeah, it seems like we might have some connectivity issues between the remotes. I wonder if perhaps when the device got disconnected, if it got uncopiloted. Maybe. So should we hop back into settings? Yeah, that's great. We'll okay. use this as a great oh. There, wait a second. I see pilot and copilot are now connected. Did you get that pop up on your screen? There you go. Try again. Okay. I think we're going to try to reboot the game real quick. Yep. So one issue we're slightly aware of right now, and, and I apologize, is that uh, we have seen a few uh, reports. This is the wonderful world of software. We've seen a few reports that if you set up uh, your uh, copiloting, before the or while the game is launched sometimes the game won't recognize it so the easiest thing to do if you ever run into that scenario is just simply uh, quit the game and restart here we go again alexa tell xbox to open power star golf okay starting up power star golf All right, here we go. I have a question for you, Brandon. So that popped up as Microsoft Studios. Does that mean Microsoft worked on building that game and this may be a good game for accessibility? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. This is actually a game that was uh, created a little earlier than our, we, uh, a little further back. This is a game from about 2015, 2016. 
And uh, we weren't, just to be frank with you, we weren't really as uh, invested in his accessibility uh, back then. And so uh, really it was around the time of uh, just in the last year or so when we've been making a real push to make our games accessible. In fact, that's pretty much um, the vast majority of my job right now is just working with game studios like Halo and Minecraft to make their games more accessible. So this game, not as accessible, uh, but hopefully you'll find newer games of ours uh, to be much more accessible. That guy golfs like I do. Rock. All right, we'll try again. Wow. Hey, don't <laughs> worry. I, uh, I, uh, I'm not very good at this game, <laughs> so I feel your pain. Oh, another shank. All right, a few more shanks, and then I will make you guys suffer through this. But I gotta at least get it on the fairway. All right, here we go. Damn it. Okay, one more shank. I swear I'm done. You golf digitally like I golf in real life. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Ah, forget about it. Okay. So anyways, I suck at golf, but I can get better. Um, I feel like we're going to need to have some uh, virtual golf tournaments. Uh, that's we'll, great. And that's we'll, another uh, great thing. You know, I think, I think Caitlin touched on this. This is great for like social communication. Me and my other friends who game a lot, this is a great way for us to connect, you know, and interact through a golf game, um, you know, talk to each other and play the game together. Even though we're stuck at home, it's a way we can communicate and hang out. So it's a really, really cool thing. And before we open it up to questions and answers, I'm just going to show you the Alexa skill for the Xbox. And I'm just going to uh, completely turn off the Xbox. Super easy. Alexa, tell Xbox to turn off. Turning off. Great. So now we're going to open this up to questions. Actually, no, I want to touch on one thing first. I'm going to have Rick from Ram Mounts come around here. We'll touch on this more Tuesday, but these buttons you see that are attached to me, re attach really, really easy. It's just the swing away arms and they're attached with a clamp or directly to the wheelchair, uh, like arm system. Maybe expand on that just very briefly. Rick. Yeah, so RAM mounts consist of various modular components. So you can really connect anything anywhere essentially, but when it comes to buttons and switches or even phones or tablets, you can really mount to any position on the wheelchair to put the buttons and switches exactly where you want. Great. And in a future webinar, we'll show, we'll expand on that further and how to build out those uh, custom solutions. Right. We'll so. be doing that on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So I thought now we could open it up question to answers. So we'll just go ahead and bring Brandon and Caitlin up on split screen with us and maybe have Colin jump in and pass along questions if there are any. If not, we'll maybe just touch on a couple more quick subjects and call it good. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tyler. Um, we do have one question from James Solomon. Thank you, James. And this may be uh, for Brandon and Caitlin. Uh, he's curious about one-handedness um, when you can only use one joystick on the adaptive controller but need both. Is there any insight you can provide in that area? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny, uh, one-handed use is something, is, is a lot of the, the, a lot of the, the questions we get asked is, uh, there's just a lot of people for that for whatever reason can only use one hand. Um, I can think of a lot of different ways to do it, but I'd love to get actually Caitlin's opinion first. Caitlin, um, when you're doing one-handed setups, largely, how do you like to, to proceed? Sure. Uh, so a little quick backstory is in the beginning stages of Warfighter Engage, we were working with veterans who were, you know, very active people and they would sustain these injuries and were devastated that they couldn't play anymore. Um, most of them had limb loss, so they might have lost one or both arms. And, you know, they would tell us, like, I... I lost my hands, you need hands to game, so I can't game anymore. And we would say, well, let's think about it a different way. You might not have your hands anymore, but you do have your mouth and your head and your chin and your feet and your legs. Um, so we would kind of reframe things and kind of come at it from a different way. So certainly there are different one-handed approaches you could kind of try to take depending on the game. But I'd also try to encourage people to think out of the box. So maybe you game with one hand, maybe you also have a sip and puff controller in your mouth. So you might 
might be doing um, right stick with a one-handed joystick here, and then you're doing left stick with your mouth. Also using the shift function that Brandon showed us earlier, you could use the same joystick and be using right stick, then you hold down the shift button and now you're looking around with left stick. So there are quite a few different options in terms of that as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the idea of thinking out of the box. I mean, uh, we're, we're trying, you know, I, I like to, to think of myself as a, as a, with kind of a, when I approach these issues, I try to think of them with a hacker mentality. Like what, you know, what do I got at, you know, at, at my disposal? And that includes what does, what capabilities the person have that wants to to game, and then what are all the cool gadgets and gizmos um, and other devices out there that could work? And so um, I've seen people do some really cool stuff where um, they've uh, put one of those big joysticks down on the ground, one of the Logitech joysticks, and they've actually used their foot to move that uh, to boot to do the walking, and then they'll use the one-handed PDP stick to to you know to move around. Um, I've seen people. Um, uh, I've I've also seen somebody there's a there's a board you can get uh, what's it called the not stinky board the uh, uh, 3D rudder 3D rudder yeah there's one, a board called the 3D rudder that you can actually use your feet to move left and right forward and back and so we had a uh, I had a, a young kid who came over and visited us at Halo uh, about mm, about a month or two ago and uh, we brought him in we had a 3D rudder set up um, he has he's he has a prosthetic arm and then um, his his uh, standard arm. Uh, we had him using the PDP to move around with that and then uh, or to look around with that and then he was using the 3D rudder to to move left and right forward and back and it was funny because some of the game devs were looking at that and they're like whoa that's kind of fun like it gets your whole body involved you know you're moving left right back forth so um, there's lots of cool things to do and, and there's lots of great YouTube videos highly recommend you check out YouTube lots of people showing out how they've set up their setups and uh, uh, we hope to find ways to make those more visible uh, moving forward so people can uh, easily find configurations and equipment and uh, games that work best for them. Yeah, and I will call out uh, one charity called Special Effect. They're in the UK and they've put out a ton of videos and information uh, where they've done various types of setups and kind of gone over the different peripherals that are out there. So I would uh, suggest starting with them as well. Yeah, they're fantastic. All right, thanks, Brandon and Caitlin. Uh, we are getting a lot of questions, so thanks everyone for for uh, being extremely interactive. Also, feel free to use the raise hand function as well if you'd like. Um, we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. So next one is to Paul Selisky. Thanks, Paul, for the question. Uh, he did call out that the quad stick does not work with the Xbox adaptive controller. Um, I guess this would be a question for for all the panelists. Is there any recommendations or workarounds that you might uh, offer? Yeah, so there are um, there are a number of different devices out there right now um, that people are using to control their wheelchairs, that are people using to control uh, their computers. And to be clear, not all of them will necessarily work with the adaptive controller. Basically, the adaptive controller recognizes um, a hid input for um, a joystick. So if the device reports out as a joystick, then we can recognize it and map the first um, eight buttons on the device, as well as the axis, the up, down, left, right, and have it all software remapped. But if the device reports out as something else, a custom or something like that, that then it won't work. So what I would highly recommend is, uh, first off, uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you're curious about whether your device works with the Xbox Adaptive Controller, uh, contact your manufacturer and, and ask them, does it work with the adaptive controller? And if they're like, we don't know, ask them, does it work as a USB joystick? Does it report out as a USB joystick? And if not, I do know there's some workarounds and some software solutions out there, some hardware solutions being built. In fact, Able Gamers just came out with, um, oh, I'm gonna forget the name of it, but it's a little device that actually allows some people to connect their uh, wheelchair um, joysticks to the adaptive controller. Um, there's just uh, there's a lot of different solutions and possibilities out there that you can ask about. And what's great is Microsoft has an email alias. It's X, the letter X, access, A-C-C-E-S-S, -S, at Microsoft.com. 
Again, xaccess at microsoft.com. And if you have any questions uh, related to game accessibility or getting the adaptive controller working with your equipment, feel free to shoot us a question. And um, that's actually, I'm on that alias. There's a few other of us that are on that alias. We'll try to get your response as quick as we can. We might not always have the answer, especially if you're working with a de device we've never worked with before, but we'll always try to get you um, the, uh, the information that we have. Yeah, and when it comes specifically to the quad stick, um, like Brennan mentioned, a lot of times for the quad stick, especially depending on when you've gotten it, because people use them with their computers, what the quad stick speaks to the computer is not joystick, like a game joystick, it's actually emulating a mouse. So you're using it on your computer as though it's a mouse. Um, so what you need to do is basically uh, reset the software so it emulates a joystick, which is possible on the quad stick. I would contact um, the person that you got it from, likely Fred Davidson, he makes the quad sticks, and he should be able to tell you how to alter the software. This way you could plug it into the adaptive controller and use it. Uh, one more thing, um, I, uh, I looked it up real quick while Caitlin was talking. Um, it's called the Freedom Wing Adapter is uh, basically what allows an Xbox adaptive controller to connect to a wheelchair through the nine pin port. Uh, so uh, again, that's made by Able Gamers. Uh, so you can go up to ablegamers.org and uh, they, uh, you can get more information on that device there. All right, thanks everyone. Um, we now have a question from Melissa Brock. I think this is for all the panelists as well. What games would you recommend for a beginner uh, when beginning to use the adaptive controller? Wow, you know, that's a really good question. And what I kind of recommend is um, beginner. You know, it's funny, before I would say like, force somebody into a game and be like, oh, here's a game that will work for you. I try to think about it as, okay, well, what genres might you like? You know, um, let's take my dad for an example. Uh, my dad, not really into Halo, not really into Call of Duty, first person shooters are not his thing. So with him, if I was trying to get him set up with something, even if I found one of those games that was super accessible, I wouldn't necessarily be like, hey, you should play that. Cause let's be honest, he's not gonna have fun. And what's the point if he's not having fun? So instead, what I would do is my dad loves card games. And there are card games online. There's actually, a, for Xbox, there's a great uh, card game called Sally Tear. Uh, uh, and it is a hyper accessible um, uh, solitaire game. My dad loves solitaire. I get him set up with that. But, you know, if you're working with a younger kid, um, you know, uh, I would say rather than try to pick a super easy game, and there are some, you know, like I think Super Lucky's Tale would be a good one maybe to start with. Like I use that one a lot in demos um, or some of the old school. You can we have a whole back catalog of older titles that tend to use fewer buttons. I mean, I would just say, what game do you want to play? And if they say Minecraft, yeah, it's going to take them a little while, but we can get them set up with a one-handed Minecraft setup, or we can get them set up with a Minecraft where they only use their feet or, um, you know, a sip and puff setup. Um, try to speak to what they want to play rather than, you know, give them suggestions of, well, you, this game works with the adaptive controller, so you should use it. To be clear, the adaptive controller is just another controller. The games don't see it any differently. So the adaptive controller works with any game on the Xbox or on the PC. And in fact, it'll even work on a newer Android devices as well. So um, it should it should just be recognized as a game controller, nothing special. I would say maybe in a little bit in contrast to that, um, <laughs> <laughs> if you are just a therapist or you don't have a preference for game genres yet, and you're just trying to navigate the gaming space and the oh. Xbox adaptive controller space, Good games to start with are games with very minimal input. So those are things like racing games. You only need one joystick to steer the car and then maybe one button to accelerate, one to brake. So there you have four inputs right there that are, you know, you only have to find four solutions for. Um, a game that I really like is called uh, Rocket League. And it's basically you're playing soccer, but you're a car instead of a person. So that's a fun game as well. So I would look for those games that don't have a lot of buttons that you need to press in order to be able to engage and enjoy it. Um, when it comes to the more difficult side of things, those are gonna be your first person shooters where you need to walk around and then use a different stick to look around. Those are kind of getting into the more um, 
you know, more higher difficulties space. Yeah, Caitlin, I, I, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about it from the patient standpoint or the client standpoint uh, or the, the end user standpoint, the gamer standpoint. I wasn't really thinking about it from the OT perspective. I think you're absolutely right. To get started with the device, to learn about it, I think your comment about racing games is perfect. Forza is a really great game. You can basically have left, right, and accelerate, and that's all you need to play the game. Uh, and you can when you turn on all the assistive technology in it, like the ease of the difficulty settings to low and whatnot, that sort of thing, it's really simple to play. So I think, yeah, racing games are fantastic. Again, I think older school games too. Like, um, you know, there are, um, you know, you can go through a back catalog and find some of the old real basic, um, you know, uh, um, you know, games like we played when we were, well, when I was a kid, you know, maybe not you, <laughs> where we only had one or two buttons, right? Did they have the new games when you were a kid, Brandon? No, I started on Pong. I'm not joking. <laughs> yeah. I literally had my first game a Pong system. I thought you were just banging on rocks with a stick, but, you know. <laughs> Something like that. It was, it was a little bit after that. But, yeah, yeah. no, so. I, I, yeah, I mean, and go back. Like, if there's a game that you're familiar with from your from your childhood as a as an OT or as a as a, a caregiver, like, go back and see if it's on back catalog because it's a great to start with one of those. And chances are, it'll probably have simpler controls too. I just uh, actually played a hole of golf and I made it to the green two shots. So kind of as Caitlin and Brandon mentioned, you know, three inputs: of aim left, aim right, and fire. And so super easy, and you know, anything like that would be great. Awesome. All right, thanks everyone. We we have two questions from uh, two separate askers, but I think we can combine them into one. Uh, so a two-part question here. How much does the Xbox adaptive controller cost and can I use it on a PS4? Great questions. So uh, the controller itself uh, in the US costs uh, $99. So it sits right between the price of our uh, standard controllers and the price of what we call our elite controllers. Uh, which uh, have a bunch of additional bells and whistles. Uh, you can buy it at the Microsoft Store online. So you can go up to uh, um, the Microsoft uh, Store at Microsoft.com and go to shop. Or uh, you can go into any of our retail stores, like in Bellevue, Redmond, if you're local. If you're not local, uh, um, if you're in a large metropolitan area, we often will have a store. Um, but yeah, you can order them online. Um, in terms of PS4, excuse me, um, the PS4 doesn't natively support the device, nor does the Nintendo. Um, again, the devices that it supports are PC, uh, Xbox, and newer Android devices. Now, that being said, there are some people that have come up with some pretty creative ways to get it to work with the PS4 and to work with the Nintendo. Um, we aren't opposed to those in that, like, we want everyone to game. And, uh, you know, so we invite, you know, Nintendo, Sony, anybody who wants to use our device. Oh, I forgot. It'll work with Google Stadia, too. Oh, yeah. They, they now support it, which is awesome. Thanks, Google. Uh, but, yeah, if, um, you know, two things. One is reach out to those companies and say, hey, you know, we need an adaptive controller. Can you help us out? Because it's they need to hear that these devices are important and, and that, they, that their customers need them. And then there are, you might do some YouTube searching, maybe find out some of those ways. Unfortunately, Microsoft doesn't officially support those, so we can't. We can't like give you, uh, you know, we can't support you if you're trying to get your adaptive controller working with your PS4. But yeah, uh, there I've seen I've seen it done. <laughs> All right, um, next question. So we have a question from Marlos from uh, the Netherlands. Oh, okay. He said, "Thanks a lot for the webinar so far. I work at a rehabilitation center and with a lot of young people. Many of them are gamers. For a particular case, I have right now." 18 year old C4 SCI who has an adaptive controller already, I'm trying to make a set where he can just dive in. Is there a possibility to connect his wheelchair joystick to the Xbox adaptive controller without having to plug anything in? It's all going to depend on what, what kind of wheelchair joystick it is and what the signal that it's putting off is. Like Brandon mentioned, there's a different nine pin ones and there's some other Bluetooth ones as well. So it's definitely going to depend on that. And then, um, as Brandon mentioned, there's also the new Able Gamers um, connective device that came out that if he has that type of wheelchair, it will be able to connect it with the Xbox adaptive controller. Um, another uh, resource that you might want to look into is there is a joystick called the Ultra Stick. 
And what they do is if your client has the kind of U-shaped body point handle on his wheelchair joystick that he's used to using, um, he would be able to, uh, they, you can take a body point attachment, put it on that type of joystick. And we found that a lot of clients that we've worked with that do use the U-shape handles, um, we could basically make a joystick that feels familiar and is almost the same as the one that they're already using. And they're kind of able to jump into it a lot quicker. All right. Um, next question here from Samuel Misko. Is there a way I can get more technical detail on USB compatibility of the USB ports? Our team is developing a balanced board game controller that we want to be out of the that we want to be out of the box compatible with the Mac. However, we're having a lot of trouble getting the USB connection to work with the Mac. We have a workaround now, but want to know if there's a developer manual online anywhere. Yeah, that is a great question. So um, if you go up and um, oh, I'm trying to remember, there is a link for it. If you search on Xbox Adaptive Controller input specifications i think um yes um the exact article is called xbox adaptive controller input specification for device makers and it's on support.xbox.com and uh i don't know uh, tyler i can send this out afterwards to you and then maybe you can share it out to, to everyone who joined as well as any other uh, docs or suggestions on articles um it will tell you exactly what the input specification is for both the USB ports and the 3.5 millimeter jacks. All right. Um, now we have a question from uh, Werner uh, Klein Schuster, and I promise I apologize if I if I mess up anyone's name in advance, but um, I'm using the Kinesic mouse. Are there plans to use facial features or facial gestures with the Connect? Oh, that's a great question. So, uh, unfortunately, Microsoft no longer supports Connect for Xbox, and we are not uh, at this time uh, making any statements around any future plans for um, the Connect on our gaming consoles. So, to that end, I would say, uh, you know, nothing really there there to talk about. Um, that I have means... a question real quick, Brandon. Yeah. So I use the Toby Eye Gaze on my Surface Pro tablet, and I can pull up the Xbox controller on the tablet. Could I use that in concert with my buttons? Yeah. So you can use, um, you could use an Toby Eye Gaze if you were streaming your console to your PC, you could use the Toby eye gaze but you would need to you can send basic button commands like a b x y and up and down with it right. you would not be able to send the more advanced commands like analog stiff left and right and the triggers now it's not to say that there isn't an opportunity for someone to write software and, and it may exist and maybe caitlin you even know about it of software that takes toby and emulates a joystick or gamepad hid, uh, but right now I'm not familiar with any. Um, but yeah, that's a great point you bring up about Toby. Caitlin, do you know anything about that? Um, I, I think what I was going to say, unless anything has come up recently in the past few months, is you could use Toby as a gaming input, but you cannot use it in conjunction with the Xbox Adaptive Controller. So you can't use some buttons from the Xbox Adaptive Controller and then use Toby as your joystick. It has to be two separate things. Oh, so you're saying if I have an adaptive controller plugged into my PC and I have a Toby plugged into my PC, it's going to recognize those as two dis dis distinctive, uh, discrete inputs. And if I'm playing a game, it's going to I'm going to be basically using one input or the other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can't use switch buttons for fire and then the Toby for look around. It's either you play a game using Toby or you play a game using the Xbox adaptive controller inputs. Unfortunately, as far as I'm aware of right now, unless somebody has come up with a solution to that. Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, my understanding is that's a, a DirectX thing where basically it's just being seen as two different game inputs and most games usually only want to allow one game input at a time. Uh, so I wouldn't be aware of any changes there, but that's something interesting to explore and it'd be great, you know, it, it brings up a great conversation if there was a way we could 
could find a way to partner with Toby on that. But in terms of on the console side of things, uh, there's no way to hook a Toby up to a uh, uh, a console. And again, we aren't supporting Connect for console at this time. Great. And we're hoping to do a webinar on the Toby eye gaze with Surface Tablet in the near future. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Toby, and this is slightly off topic, but Microsoft revamped the software that interacts with the Toby, and it, it makes a world of difference. It, the, the access to it's incredible. It's a much more, uh, you know, workable device now if you use Microsoft software. Maybe Brandon, can you show, tell everyone where that is real quick in the Microsoft? I think it's the ease of access. Oh yeah, yeah. So once you plug in the device, it'll install all the drivers, take all that. And then under ease of access, there's a whole section now. Uh, I believe it's under uh, eye control. Yeah, it's under cool. eye control settings. Right, starting you off topic, but I just thought- No, that no, it's good. all good. You're throwing, you're, you're throwing me curveballs. It keeps me on my toes. I love it. There you go. <laughs> All right, next question. We have a question from Chantal Grafton. Can the controller uh, be used with Windows Correct? W Windows Correct? I'm I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm not familiar with Windows Correct. Um, if, if 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 you can uh, follow back with a clarifying with some clarification, um, that'd be great because I'm I'm. There, we may have something called, we have a lot of stuff out there. There may be something that I'm not familiar with, but I've never heard of that. Okay, uh, thanks, Brandon. I'll continue to monitor the chat uh, if Chantal follows up on that. Um, next question from, <coughs> excuse me, from Ramu uh, Iyer. Is Microsoft Envision working on gamification of a business process so that new employees can learn when they onboard? Perhaps using Xbox as an inclusive game, gaming platform an idea for technology roadmap um not that i'm aware of but that'd be great i'd love to go through a new uh new hire and orientation again if that were the case um you know it's funny gamification uh there's been this weird for a while everything was gamification like every person i talked to externally was talking to me about gamifying this or that i feel like there's been kind of a pullback in the industry lately, I don't hear as much uh, people talking about gamification. Not to say that there's not tons of value in it. Um, I think a lot of people just didn't realize like making games are, is hard, especially a game that someone wants to play, right? I think, and we've seen this in the rehab space, and you've probably seen this, Caitlin, mm -hmm. where someone comes up with a rehab video game and it sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is a little off topic, but we've seen that a lot and we get asked a lot. Um, of therapists who want to or game makers who want to make a rehab game and they're usually really simplistic it's like you know the character jumps over the rock and it's it's very simplistic and what we kind of always tell people is that gaming is culture and gaming is something that brings people together and people want to play games that everybody else is playing they want to play Fortnite and they want to play halo and they want to play all the things that their friends are doing so we kind of advise people to try to steer away from uh things like therapy games and focus on getting people engaged in um what they want to do to be part of mainstream culture and what their friends and family are doing but so to that point, you know, like I, I will say, like, even when I give presentations to small groups or education training sessions, I try to gamify it, right? Like I try to have quizzes and I try to have pro little prizes. I throw candy out to people like you try to make it fun, right? So I think it's a great idea. And I think it would be awesome if we had something like that. But um, I'm I'm not aware of anything that's being done at that at this time with Microsoft on that. Um, uh, and what I would and again to say just more broadly, I think. Um, there's been a bit of a decline in in the the notion of gaming uh, gamification, or at least I don't hear as much about people coming to me asking about gamification, um, which is maybe a sad thing. Like it, it, I, I I much prefer playing games than reading technical documents or watching boring you you know training videos. <laughs> so I've I've uh, I have to admit something. I I accidentally read that last question wrong. So we'll oh. go back to Chantal Grafton. Okay. The controller can be used with Windows. Correct. Oh, Windows. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. it can be used with Windows 10. Um, now, with with all functionality. Now, it will work all the way up to Windows 7, but you won't be able to remap the controls on it. Um, the software that uh, we use to remap the this, 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 the different buttons that I showed you earlier that only um, works on Windows 10. But yes, the device can be connected to anything up to Windows 7 
and uh, the, the back ports will work natively. In addition, you can program the device um, um, and set the three profiles. You can store three profiles on it and it will memorize those profiles. So if I take that to a Windows 7 PC and I switch between those profiles, those software remappings will be remembered and will be moved. Um, you just won't be able to create any new software mappings. Yeah, and one point of clarification, because I get asked this question a lot, is it works on Windows 10 through the Xbox app for gaming, but you cannot use the adaptive controller as though it's a mouse and like open yeah. Word and do typical computer stuff with it. There are a few um, different softwares that allow you to kind of pack it. One of them is called Joy to Key. Yeah. Um, so through using Joy to Key, you can set up the adaptive controller's inputs to emulate a mouse, um, but out of the box. It, it works Windows 10 gaming, but not just on Windows. Yeah, that's a great point. It acts as a, as a game pad. So think about everything that you can do with a game pad, you can do with an Xbox adaptive controller. So on Windows, anything you can do with a game pad, you can do. But obviously, you know, right now I can't use Windows with my, my Xbox controller connected to my, my PC, my Windows 10 PC. Um, so um, the game pad or the, um, uh, the adaptive controller, it'll be the same situation. Again, I think that the comment you called out, Joy to Key, there's a few others, um, uh, pieces of software out there that can take joystick input and emulate keyboard and mouse input. Um, uh, those are uh, uh, options you can look into. Again, those aren't officially supported by Microsoft, but I do know people are using them. Thank you. Uh, so Chantal did follow up with a question, which I believe that you just answered. Can the controller be used to control my laptop video games? So not sure if there's anything additional you wanted to. Laptop video games, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, as long as it's uh, Windows 7 or higher. And uh, yeah, uh, it'll work. All right. Um, thank you. Now we're going to move to another question from uh, Kiranveer Singh. Can I play GTA with it? Any game that you can play with a controller, you can play with uh, an adaptive controller, assuming that you're on a supported platform, Xbox, Windows, newer Android device, uh, Stadia. So uh, it's been a long time since I played GTA. I have kids now, so I'm not allowed to play GTA anymore in the house. But um, if you can play it with a controller, you can play with the Xbox adaptive controller. And yeah, GTA 5 is on the console. So yes, you can you can totally play it with a adaptive controller. All right. Um, I think that actually just covered all of the the open questions that we had. So now um, maybe Tyler, do we want to hand it back over to you? Yep. Well, thank you all for joining us today. And a special thank you to Caitlin and Brandon. They spent countless hours with me trying to figure this out. Their time was not just uh, answering those questions and explaining this. Uh, they had to deal with my dumb ass trying to figure these things out. So um, much appreciated. Thank you guys both very much. A couple more people to thank. Uh, Michael Duncan, uh, Colin Boyd, who you heard, Kat Jackson, and who am I forgetting? Rick, my brother Victor. He's here manning the Command Central, the director of this little event. So um, this quick couple notes, I will be sending out a link to this recorded event so you can access it later. I will also in the near future be doing a little more detailed like setup instructions, close up views and stuff. And I'll send out links where to find that. I'll also be sending out a survey. I'd be very grateful if anyone out there could fill that out for me. And the last thing would be is just a quick update on our upcoming calendar. This upcoming Tuesday, what's the date? Coming Tuesday, Rick? 31st. 31st, we have RAM mounts with Rick Phillips. We're going to talk about accessible mounts, just like the ones we use for this button. On Thursday, we have Google Assistant. We're going to talk Thursday the 3rd, 2nd, my bad. I can't even know how to do dates. <laughs> what can you do? So, yeah, Thursday, we are going to do Google Assistant while we talk about Google Home, all those types of things. Uh, upcoming past that, we have Canova Robotics. We also have a virtual reality webinar. And one I'm really excited about is an autonomous feeding robot. How I can get a robot to feed me with just the use of my voice or a switch. We're going to have my friend Tapo, who works on the UW Robotics team, and most likely Sid, the guy in charge of University of Washington Robotics. So that'll be really exciting. So thank you all again. Thank you all to those who helped me, especially thank you to Brandon and Caitlin.
and I hope to see you all in these upcoming weeks. Take care.